super important for us, you know, for institutions to and for people of color to make sure that their history is documented and, and celebrated properly without having a museum that is charged with the responsibility to make sure that that documentation and that archiving of history and artifacts actually happens, it can get lost in the weeds, you know, because we are the students and the ambassadors of the culture and we are the architects of this museum, we can feel certain that the story is gonna to be told the right way. So when did you come up with this idea that you were going to tell me what it is exactly? So the Universal Hip Hop Museum is dedicated to the preservation and celebration of hip hop history and culture. It's the only museum that exists to do so. Mm -hmm. um, and hip hop has been around since 1973. We'll be yeah. celebrating its 50th anniversary uh, in 2023. Mm -hmm. And this museum is basically going to be uh, responsible for documenting and and preserving and telling the stories of this amazing culture that has become the most popular art form in the world. So Rocky, did you found it? I'm, I'm one of the original founders. I'm one of the main persons that created the opportunity, let's call it an opportunity. How long ago did you know you were gonna do it? So this journey started 10 years ago. My background in music goes all the way back to the early seventies. Mm -hmm. I was working, I was working at the time uh, when this opportunity came uh, came to me, I was an executive director of a nonprofit uh, after school basketball program called the New York Gauchos here in New York City. Right. And two real estate developers approached me about trying to expand the gym's presence in, in the Bronx. And, and from that opportunity led to this, this mission that I've been on for the past 10 years to get this museum started. Why is it that Big Pun and Biggie Smalls have a uh, have streets named after them, right? Why do they have streets named after them? And then other, you know, like uh, uh, DJ Cool, Cool uh, Herc, yeah, doesn't doesn't have a street named after him. Well, Cool Herc is still living. That's yeah. one reason. Mm -hmm. uh, so the people who have streets named after them have to be deceased mm -hmm. here in New York City. Is he going to uh, get a street named after him? Well, when he, you know, let's no let's hope that around? he's. Let, let's hope that he's around for many, many years because he's only in his late 60s. So have uh, you have you met with him about this idea? Cool Herc, yes, I have. And what's his thoughts about it? Uh, well, Herc is a very interesting person. He understands the importance of history, but, you know, he puts his history above everybody else's. So, so sometimes that can be a conflict when okay, you're trying to create it. But he was kind of the first. Now, were you into hip hop back then? Did you go to any of his parties? I did go to some of his parties. I actually started as a teenage DJ a couple of years after he started. So I've been around hip hop since the very beginning. Now, were you in some of those street, um, those street parties where they would just pull up and plug it into a light switch, you know, into a light pole and keep on going? You're talking, you're talking to the guy that was an expert in doing that. Right. So my understanding is that it all, started as sort of a reaction to disco. How does it go from disco to, to hip hop? Teenagers like myself back then in the early 70s, uh, our favorite, you know, stations were black music that played James Brown, Parliament Funkadelic, mm -hmm. uh, Sly and the Family Stone, Aretha Franklin. Still pretty good uh, music. Great music, you know, so we, we grew up more on soul, funk and R&B. Uh, than, you know, the electronic music of Giorgio Marauder and the Bee Gees and Donna mm -hmm. Summer. We really didn't listen to that. What yeah. it really inspired us was, you know, the, the, the music that really spoke to the community. So mm -hmm. James Brown, the Godfather of Soul, his rhythms, his, uh, his songs really spoke about empowerment. And, and, and that's the kind of uh, mindset that we came out of. So, uh, understand the time period coming out of the civil rights movement and what, what was called the Black Power Movement of the early 70s. So you had a combination of the Black Power Movement, you had uh, films that we call Black exploitation films, mm -hmm. Foxy Brown, Shaft, all those kind of films. That's what we were exposed to. Mm -hmm. So, you know, for, for us, it was just a natural thing 
uh, that when, you know, when we wanted to play music, we played that music that we were familiar with. And it just so happened that that music also spoke to uh, the type of music that, that became synonymous with, with hip hop. Uh, you know, songs that had what we call the get down part or the break beat. Mm -hmm. And now, disco, right. disco music didn't have that. No, it did. Not only did it not have that, you're playing on all these street corners. You don't have any instruments. So no, so, no instruments. The, the so, turntables were, were the instruments. How long did it take for that to rise till you actually knew that the turntable was an instrument? Scratching, which is called turntablism now, but the scratch wasn't really popular in the very early stages of hip hop. Mm -hmm. Hip hop started in 73 and the turntables back then, Jesse, were belt driven. So the technology itself would not allow for spinning the records back and forth. It wasn't until the advent of direct drive turntables, which was created by Technique, where the mm -hmm. motor was a little bit stronger than the belt driven turntables that allowed the manipulation of the turntable for the DJ to go back and forth, you know, scratching with, with the needles. So th that happened like later, like 1976, 77, where scratching started to come in. But it, scratching really didn't make, make, the, make the, the popularity of hip hop. It was more about the poetic uh, choreography between the MC and the DJ. So the rapper and the DJ in co combination uh, is what really excited the audience. When we say hip hop culture, what are we describing? Because it's not the same as as rap music. What's the difference between hip hop culture and rap music? So rap music is what you do. Hip hop is what we are, the culture. Hip hop is represented by five different elements. The core elements of hip hop is DJing, MCing, graffiti, breaking or b-boying, b-boys and b-girls. And the last one is knowledge. So it's all those uh, aspects of hip hop culture that assimilated together to form what we call hip hop. Now, graffiti was around before hip hop. So how did it get incorporated in? And were you already aware of graffiti, you know, in the early 70s? Yep. So I grew up in the Bronx. I'm, I'm a, you know, born and raised, uh, you know, resident of the Bronx. And I grew up in a middle class neighborhood. I didn't grow up in the projects. But, you know, every time that I would travel into the city, I would have to go through the South Bronx, take the train through the South Bronx. So I was exposed to, you know, the different environments and seeing graffiti on the trains and on the walls. And I even got involved in, in some graffiti myself when I was a teenager. Graffiti got incorporated into the culture through Africa Bambata, who founded the Zulu Nation, right? The Zulu Nation was a foundation that is created the framework for bringing all the different aspects of the culture together to form one entity that everyone understands was the reason for movies being made like Wild Style and Beat Street and so on and so forth. Now, did when he came on the scene, did did was there an understanding that this was something different, that it was moving forward to a new stage? You know, what did what would um, Cool Herc have said about this? Would he have seen this as something new and different? When we were doing it as teenagers, we were just in the moment. We really didn't really understand that this was turning into becoming something. It wasn't until 1977, 1978 that the recognition of this new youth movement or this new youth music started to percolate up. It started to move from the clubs, from, from the parks into the clubs. And it only started to move into like the after hour spots. It wasn't moving into the, the main nightclubs because the main nightclubs were still catering to the adults and they wouldn't allow kids with sneakers to come into the nightclubs. So the kids were really confined to doing, you know, moving, you know, from the park jam to like community centers and after hour night spots where they really didn't care what you did, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and the popularity really started to happen when the whites started to hear these tapes that were being recorded 
and their friends would bring it back down to you know lower Manhattan to the city and they would start to hear this music that the kids up in the Bronx were playing. So it, it piqued their interest, like Charlie Ahern, the director of the movie Wild Style, he heard this music because Malcolm McLaren, who's a musician, uh, would come up to the Bronx and just listen to the DJs and was fascinated by everything. And then he would share that with his white friends in the city and Charlie Ahern being one of them. Charlie would then bring his camera because he was a guy that liked to, you know, take pictures and do film. And he would come up and just start to document what was happening in these small community centers and nightclubs. And when we saw people like Charlie Ahern and others coming from downtown uptown, it started to take on a different different kind of life. Now, did you, did, now, is this before or after Planet Rock? Before. Before that point, did you start to recognize people coming uptown and saying, yes. wait a minute, this is an interesting thing, something different's happening here? Yep, so from 1978, the first commercial records were recorded in 1979. Mm -hmm. So um, Sugar Hill Gang's Rapper's Delight, 1979. Curtis Blow Christmas Rap in 1979, Funky Four Plus One. So the first recording contracts were end of 1978, beginning in 1979. It was from 1978 to 1978 where you started to see this transformation of just kids having fun in the park to now people saying, hey, these guys got something special here. Let me figure out how to monetize and commercialize what these guys are creating and put it into something that people can buy. Now, Malcolm McLaren took that vibe and brought it to England and made a band called the Sex Pistols. Now, when, do you remember being aware of that? And were you surprised by that? So it's funny because hip hop and punk rock almost have a same starting point, the late seventies. And the two kind of like have a same kind of youth movement, punk rock and hip hop. And it was, during that time, the Sex Pistols and uh, CBGBs, a nightclub in New York City, that all started to celebrate that kind of uh, music genre. At the same time, hip hop was being exposed to other people. So hip hop takes from samples from different genres, from jazz, R&B, country and western, rock and roll, punk rock. We play pieces of these different type of records, Jesse we would go crate digging in, in the record stores to find obscure records that nobody else was playing on the radio that we would take and, and make popular, right? Yeah. And it was those different breakbeats, you know, Billy Squire and the Rolling Stones and Talking Heads. And we would play all those kind of records in the streets and black radio wasn't playing none of those records. And that's what really made hip hop popular. Now, Planet Rock was a, a pretty big milestone, no? As a record. Planet Rock was one of the biggest records of hip hop during the early 80s. So from 1979 to 1985 is when hip hop exploded. We actually have an exhibit that we produced called The Revolution of Hip Hop right. that specifically celebrates 1980 to 1985 because it was that time period when the first records would get played on radio, when the first hip hop movies uh, were dis distributed, uh, Wild Style and Beat Street. And, mm -hmm. and, and the first commercial product, Curtis Blow on a Sprite commercial. So that whole explosion started to happen during the early 80s. And what did you think when you saw Wild Style? I was a fan, but I wasn't a fan of it when it came out, but I'm a fan of it now because as I, as I look backwards and see it, it, it was the only thing that was documenting what was actually happening in the streets. So, you know, if, if Charlie Ahern didn't have the wherewithal to take his camera and ca capture that, that part of history would not even exist. When you, do you remember when you first saw Grandmaster Flash? Flash is a personal friend of mine. So I used to uh, DJ at a nightclub in the Bronx called the Stardust Ballroom. And I used to be a club and concert promoter as well. So after, you know, when I wasn't DJing I, and I wanted to promote my own parties, I would hire all these guys, Grandmaster Flash, uh, DJ Hollywood, Eddie Cheever, some of these guys you may not, may, may, may not have heard of, but they were the biggest of the biggest back then in New York City at that time. And, and Grandmaster Flash, did he bring it to yet a new level? Well, he 
he did in the sense that he he was one of the first guys to combine a group of MCs, five different guys, five different personalities, and and work them to death like a basketball coach to make their make their uh, storytelling part of a performance. So he was an architect that brought out the best of these MC, these young MCs. And he was the fastest of the fast when it came to cutting and scratching on the turntables. So yes, he is one of the most iconic persons that really took hip hop to the next level. But it wasn't until he started to make records we really accelerate fashion during these times like how did it evolve over the over the period did it just keep changing as times went on it continues to change so fashion is probably one of the unsung elements of hip-hop but it, it, it is what would define the culture you know the look the swag how people dressed is how they acted it made you feel a certain way when you wore certain clothing you know just walking into the room with uh, shell toe Adidas, with the laces not tied up or having fat shoelaces or Lee jeans or uh, knit sweaters with the Kango cap and the gazelle glasses. If you walked in to a hip hop party and you didn't have that kind of look, you just were like an odd person in the room, right? right. You know, so you had to have, you know, the people who came out to the nightclubs knew that if you was going to a hip hop party, you had to play the role. Did um, women play a role in the early days of hip hop? They most certainly did. So MC Shah Rock being the first female MC, she was in the group, the Funky Four Plus One. They were the first group to be invited to perform on Saturday Night Live. So, and she was part of that performance, right? So um, uh, Blondie with the song Rapture and Fab Five Freddy. You know, so that evolution, you know, women's involvement, they were there from the very beginning, whether they were DJing, you know, some early DJs that you didn't even hear about, MCing or B-boys and B-girls, they were all part of it. So without the women, uh, hip hop would have been a very stale uh, thing and, and it probably would have faded away many years ago. Fab Five Freddy's an interesting character being b before he was on MTV. Um, before he, he ever, a, he was a graffiti artist. And, and did you know him in those early days? Was he around? Uh, he, he was around and, and very, you know, very prominent, uh, because of his graffiti, you know, he was fabulous. Fabulous was one of his writing names and, and he was from, is from Brooklyn and you know, he heard about what was happening up in the Bronx. So he would travel from Brooklyn all the way up to the Bronx and come to the parties. And it was that inspiration coming to the Bronx and seeing what was going on. And then, you know, connecting it to what he was doing as a graffiti artist that really made the transition from uptown to downtown. He was one of those persons that helped bring what was happening in the streets of the Bronx into Manhattan. Him and a, a gentleman by the name of Michael Holman, who's well, also, uh, one of the architects for bringing the uptown scene downtown. So is this now at the point that that we're we're getting to Def Jam? And do you remember Russell Simmons? Was he around then? And you know what what was the impetus for for that? Like I said, I was the club and concert promoter. Russell was also a club promoter. Uh, his company was called Rush Management. Uh, where he managed the careers of Run DMC, Houdini, Curtis Blow, and so many others. But before he had his management company, he, his promotion company was called Rush Productions. And he and I and my other friend, Jerry Roebuck, we would promote clubs in New York City and have Flash and some of these guys come down and perform to people in New York City. So he was very instrumental in getting hip hop to uh, move up to where it became commercialized, but then he took it to the next level with Rush Management and Def Jam Records. So when he founded Def Jam Records in 1982, 83, uh, he was already a successful artist manager. He had Curtis Blow already. He had Houdini. Uh, he, he was managing his brother, Run, Run DMC. And then when he had Def Jam, 
he brought on LL Cool J. And then it just kind of like mushroomed from there on. Now, what, do you remember when you first heard um, that first Run DMC record? I do. And, <laughs> and were you like, this is going to be something different? I mean, what, what did you think? Because this, this sort of brought it someplace else, yeah? What, what happened was... The, the, the records like Planet Rock and the records that came out before, like Sugar Hill Gang, they were more like rapping over R&B medallies, right? The difference with Run DMC's record and Sucker MC's in particular, it was raw. It was just drums, pop, 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 you know, and then rapping on top. But that was the sound that was actually the way it sounded in the streets back in the park jams. We were playing the raw hardcore rock and drum beats and having guys rap on top of that. But when people started to make rap records, they started to add bass line and, and guitar lines and became more of an R&B sound. But what Rick Rubin and Russell quickly identified was that no, let's make it more like what it used to be and make it as hard and as raw as possible. And that's why it just transformed everything. When those songs came out, it transformed everything. Now, the Aerosmith collaboration, you know, what did that do? You know, you know, what did that do when you saw that? What did you think? It was interesting. It wasn't the best record to me that Run DMC uh, made, but what it did, it opened the uh, awareness of hip hop to a greater rock and roll audience that may have not otherwise even tuned in to watch a Run DMC. And by that time, Jesse, you know, by the time that Run DMC had created Walk This Way with Aerosmith, MTV was already playing hip hop. Could you have had hip hop the way we have it today without MTV at that time? Absolutely not. MTV opened the, the acceptance of hip hop to the entire world. Right, so I, I talk to people in Africa and in Europe and in Asia, and when I speak to them and I ask them, "How did you, you know, get connected to hip hop?" Two ways. You want to know the two ways? Yeah. Our soldiers, our U.S. servicemen, would take cassette tapes and they get deployed all around the world, and they would play the music on boom boxes in these different cities, and that was like people were like, "What are you playing? What? What is that music?" And then the second way they got exposed to it is by watching MTV. Then it goes for, you have LL Cool J, you have all those guys who came up on, on Def Jam. You know, how do you get from Def Jam to Wu-Tang? So now Def Jam created something that all record labels wanted to emulate, right? It's gold in those hills, right? Right. How do we get involved with hip hop? We can't just let Def Jam be the only one in Colombia and Sony Music making all the money. We got to make money too. Right. I had a label called Strong City Records, which came a couple years after Def Jam. And I was independent and I had songs distributed by Island Records. And then I had my own distribution deal with Uni MCA Records. And there were others, Cold Chilling with Warner Brothers and, and uh, Priority Records with EMI and and then Virgin got into it. And, and then before you know it, every label had their star production company or they had their star rap group. And it just exploded from there. Uh, Wu-Tang was a very special, you know, group. Have you been surprised at their longevity and, you know, how they've sort of gone into lots of other things now? You know, Method does, you know, they all do different things now. I'm not surprised at all because... When you listen to the story that RZA, the, the founding member of the Wu-Tang Clan, and you just understand his mentality. He started as a solo MC artist on Tommy Boy Records, and he had a dismal career. And it wasn't until he teamed up with the other guys from his neighborhood to form the Wu-Tang Clan that it, that it took off. But he had the proper understanding as an entrepreneur and his previous experience being an artist on Tommy Boy Records, everything not to do. Right. So that failure in his own career set him up to help guide the careers of all the other members of the Wu-Tang Clan. And what he properly did, he knew that, look, I'm going to create something as a group, but then we're going to spin off individual careers for each of you guys 
and I'm going to be your producer. And they were like, let's do it. <laughs> and thankfully for them, he was a mastermind because he, he created a money making machine that has just transformed everything. Now they're in film. They got their, you know, uh, a new television series on Hulu. Yeah. Uh, they're doing merchandising. The brand is just exploded all around the world. The Fujis and Puffy, you know, that that layer, you know, how did did you see that coming in and what did you think of it? I didn't see the Fujis, um, but I'm, I'm not surprised by it at all uh, because the West Indian sound is such an important fabric of music in general. And it was such an important fabric of hip hop. DJ Cool Herc is West Indian. Grandmaster mm. Flash is West Indian. So the West Indian roots in hip hop is strong and it has always been. But the bad boy, I, I saw coming. I saw that two miles away mm -hmm. uh, because as music video uh, became such a prominent marketing tool for, for the music business, for, for promoting hip hop music or rap records, Puff Daddy was a marketing genius. He took the sensationalism of sexy women and, you know, putting, you know, jewelry on and, and the cars and just made it aspirational so that everybody wanted to look like these hip hop stars. And his presence, all the bling that was associated with those bad boy music videos just made it more of a commercial thing that people wanted and felt like they needed to have. So bad boy, bad boy took the commercialization of the culture and just pushed it about five stories up. His business acumen, Jay-Z's business acumen, um, isn't that also part of the story of hip hop? All, all of us, you know, played a role in, in the streets. You know, we knew how to make money as teenagers by, you know, promoting parties and, you know, uh, going out there and, and getting people to spend money on things they shouldn't spend money on. And Jay-Z also came from that background. You know, him and Diddy and others, they came as street hustlers. So they just took their knowledge of working the streets and converted it into working records and to making music and, and, and hustling. And Jay-Z was not a bad uh, talent in his own right. But then he knew that look, I have something that I know how to leverage. I know how to create something and, and turn it into something even bigger. So he created a blueprint for Rockefeller Entertainment and Rockefeller Clothing, and, and then it just kind of like accelerated from there on. Now, I can take a tour bus around the Bronx and they can show me places where these things occurred, right? I can go to Japan. I can hear performers who can't speak English sing to me in perfect English. They can rap to me in perfect English, but they can't speak it. You know, I go to South Africa, I can go to Brazil. This music's everywhere. How are you going to put all of this in a museum and what's that gonna be like? <laughs> so we're creating a 21st century, what we call smart museum. And as you rightfully stated, hip hop is now accepted all around the world. How are we gonna curate the global evolution and make people feel like they are being represented in, in this museum. We are working with the finest architectural team, the Smith Group that worked on the National Museum of African American History and Culture. We have the best in, uh, interpretive design team, Ralph Applebaum Associates, who uh, create presidential libraries and, and other fantastic museums. We're working with MIT and technology companies like Microsoft so that we can create immersive experiences. We're only gonna have a 52,000 square foot museum when we open in 2024, but it's gonna be unlike any other museum. Digital footprints, digital immersive storytelling, artifacts, flexible rooms, open air spaces, using uh, AI technology and holograms to tell not just the story of the, you know, the evolution of hip hop in America, but how it has been adopted and embraced in South America, in Asia, in England, in Russia, and the Middle East. So that's why we call ourselves the Universal Hip Hop Museum. Now, now, how are you going to 
make sure that the culture is represented in the design. You know, you have this very, very specific, uh, you know, you do this the wrong way, you know, Method Man's going to walk in there and say, what is going on in here? You know what I mean? Yep. So what we did is uh, before we even got to this part, we just started construction on our building last month. But prior to getting to this point, Jesse, what we did was Microsoft funded what we call Envision Design Sessions. And we toured the country. We went to Los Angeles, we went to Detroit, we went to Atlanta, we went to New York, and we brought people from all walks of life, people who are uh, stewards of the culture, uh, teachers, uh, artists, people who don't even know anything about hip hop. We brought them all together into a room and did a full day of focused research, asking the question, what is your idea of a hip hop museum? What kind of experiences would you like to see when you walk into a hip hop museum? And we took all that feedback from different people, different ages, from Los Angeles, Detroit, Atlanta, New York, and kind of like funneled, it, funneled all of them together to take out the best ideas to make sure that when we open this museum, it has that input that we took from the community so that people can say, that was my idea that I gave those guys back then, you know? So when, when people walk in here, they're not only gonna feel like they're at home, people who love hip hop, but even for people who are passive observers, uh, observers of hip hop, they will walk in and coming with one perception, but walk out with a total new understanding of what hip hop is. Those cities that you mentioned, Atlanta, Los Angeles, you know, very, very strong opinions about hip hop. You know, do they say, well, why is it in, why did you put it in the Bronx? You know, we should have put it here in Los Angeles. You know, do you get into those conversations and, and, you know, our memory of the people here and, you know, NWA and, you know, this is a whole different thing. Dre doesn't want that. You know, do you get into all that? Yeah. So we, we addressed that early on and what we say, look, hip hop started in the Bronx to have a museum that represents hip hop has to be in the Bronx. It can't be anywhere else. Because if it was in Washington, D.C. or Chicago or Texas, and they called it the official museum of hip hop, it would just seem disingenuous to everybody. So it has to be here in the Bronx. Um, have you, because I imagine you've had to raise a lot of money to, to get as far as you have. Did you think it was going to take this long to get where, you've, to, to get where you are now? I, I, I actually thought the road was going to be a lot easier than it has been. Uh, and the reason why it's been a little bit difficult because there's been previous music attempts to have a hip hop museum. We we're not the first, uh, but those other attempts, they were not successful. So initially it created a lot of skepticism. Oh, here's another museum that thinks they're gonna create this hip hop, you know, another organization that thinks that they're gonna create this hip hop museum. But it wasn't until we actually, you know, can demonstrate that we were able to bring together the different voices and the different egos and and get everyone to understand that we can make this project happen. And then once the city of New York and the state of New York uh, put their money behind the project, and then when, when we teamed up with our current development team that's building the affordable housing that's gonna be part of this project that we're creating, that was it. It was the, you know, it was the, the defining moment that told everybody that this project is finally arrived and, and it's going to happen. And now that people know that it's, that it's happening, now we're having some bigger discussions about how to get other people involved. With jazz music, another great American art form, you know, it's very, there is no museum that I can go to and, and, and learn about it. Why is it so important that we, we protect this or even rock music, which, you know, my family's a part of, you know, why is it so important that we have a museum for this very, very important uh, American art form that, that 20 years from now, we may not understand or know how it started or what it meant. Super important for us, you know, for institutions to, and for people of color to make sure that their history is documented and, and celebrated properly. So without having a museum that is charged with the responsibility to make sure that that documentation and that archiving of history and artifacts actually happens, it can get lost in the weeds. You know, somebody else may take ownership of it that may not be from our community and try to 
<clears throat> retell the story of hip hop history and get all the facts wrong and, and, and tell the story. And before you know it, Eminem is the first MC of hip hop. But, you know, because we are the students and the ambassadors of the culture and we are the architects of this museum, we can, we can feel certain that the story is going to be told the right way. And that's the most important reason. We wanted to make sure that the stories of hip hop are preserved and it's told the way they need to be told. Rocky, thank you so much for uh, sharing this with me today. I really appreciate it. Jesse, thank you. Great questions. Thank yeah. You. Well, I look forward to uh, coming to the opening. No doubt. You'll be on the, on the invitation list. Is there some place people can go to learn more about it online? Yeah. So if they go to our website, they sign up for our newsletter. They can mm -hmm. follow us on social media at UHH Museum on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Great. Thank you, Rocky. I'll talk All to right, you soon. Take care.